Hello, and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer. You know, I need a new battery so I can tell time. Is it four o'clock? I don't know, that's why I need a battery. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we're gonna go ahead and take a look at Charioteer from GMT. We'll get back in the review in just a moment. I want to take a minute to ask you to check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about history, books on history, military history. I even post some of my uh, lectures for my classes on there. Please check that out. Please subscribe to that channel. And now, back to the review. In Chariots here from GMT, two to six players take on the roles of chariot drivers in ancient Rome as they attempt to cross the finish line first after three laps. The game board is a map of the racetrack. You have places, of course, for the uh, charioteers to start and the finish line. You also have, of course, the corners, the sides, which have kind of double uh, uh, spaces there. And I'll explain more about that later. You also have a place for cards to come out and some various other things. Each player is going to get their own player board that they're going to place in front of them, which uh, contains areas for information they'll be using during the game. And they'll also get a hand of eight cards. Now, there'll be a space in the middle of the board for your deck of cards. You'll lay out three cards. The last space is the uh, crowd card. These will all be face up for everyone to see. And then you'll also have the Emperor's Dice at the end of the track. Now at the beginning of the game, players are going to draw a skill card. The skill card will tell them how they need to align the various skill markers on the skill track on their player board. Players are also going to get a number of uh, kind of tiles with kind of shaped corners that they're going to place uh, in front of them, face up in front of them, that only, the, only they can see. And they're going to give them different bonuses, but they can only play those once and then they're out of the game. Now, for the first turn, the first player is uh, randomly selected. After that, it's who's ever out in the lead is going to go first all the way to the, the person uh, behind. But what you do in the game is you can select up to three cards, place them face down, and if you want to, you can put a tile on top of it. Now, if you put a tile on top of it, you're going to use that tile. It will be out of the game after this round. But what you do then is you all flip over your cards. Your cards have the different symbols on them with different numbers. What you are doing is you are trying to match symbols and numbers. So if you have got three red symbols and they all have a two, that is a matching symbol. Um, you know, if you've got three green sixes or two green sixes, that is a matching symbol. And critically, you can also match those symbols with any symbol that is in the crowd card. That is the furthest crowd, furthest card rather, that has come out there. So players can see the next two cards that are coming, but the crowd card itself, they can match with that symbol. Now, in order to move, players are gonna go ahead and they're gonna add up those symbols. So what we do is, let's say you have three green sixes. So that's three, you can move three spaces, but then you get to add the number that's in that six onto it, so that would be nine. So now it's three and it's nine. So you add that number. Generally speaking, that is how you're going to move forward every round, but the symbols themselves can play a little havoc with what you're doing. First of all, the green symbols are just sprints. They just get you moving, they've got the highest numbers. They're good just to get out and go. If you match the red symbols, however, you get to deal out damage. Now, if you match, I think it's three symbols, it's minor damage. If you deal out more than three symbols, it's major damage. Everybody else on the board takes a damage cube, a, bu a blue damage cube. And you can only ever take three damage per round. So you put those in kind of your, your, your initial three spaces. Um, and then what they're going to do is at the end of the round, they will slide into kind of your damage box and you can have an unlimited theoretically there in your damage box. 
Now, when you play the yellow symbol, before you add up your, uh, your movement, you can eliminate half of your damage rounded up, and you can remove them, put them back, so you're not gonna, you don't have to deal with them when it comes to damage, because your damage, as you move, actually limits uh, your number, so you, it's, it acts as a negative. However many cubes you have in the damage essentially takes away from your movement. So if I play a yellow, and I was going to move nine, but I have four damage in there, I would move five, but if I go ahead and I play the yellow, I can remove two of those, so that I would move seven instead. Now you've also got the black symbols. Now how the black symbol works is generally the numbers are lower, but they're better at moving along the, the sides. As I say, there are two, uh, there's kind of these almost looks like piano key uh, spaces along the sides. That means ordinarily if you're going along those, you would have to go one in, one out, one in, one out, one in, one out. But if you play the black, you can ignore the, the, the bigger spaces and you can just stick to the inside spaces, giving you a shorter journey overall. Now also too, at the beginning of every round, you're gonna roll the Emperor's Dice. Now the Emperor's Dice has different symbols on it. If you make your move with that symbol, you get to move one extra space. The Emperor may potentially attack you all, in which case you take damage. Now if ever you match six symbols or more, the fans go crazy and you get to draw a tile from the fan bag. You draw one of these fan tiles, you put it in front of you. It acts just like the other tiles that can, again, give you a boost, you know, it could be like you know, a plus one green, meaning you get to go one more on green or plus three red, whatever. Maybe it lets you discard more cards. There's different things that you can do with these tiles when you play them with your hand. But critically, once you play that tile, it goes back into the bag. Now, every time you play a certain color, your skill level increases. So you've got the different skill levels on the side of your board, and if you play a red and your red's at the bottom, it gets to move up run. Uh, so you get to move them up. Once they're up at the top and you play a skill level, they get to move into the plus one area. Now this track, the whole thing is plus one. As you uh, play those that, that specific color where your, where your marker is, you get to move plus one along that track. Now the first marker that moves all the way to the right of that track gets a permanent bonus and then each one thereafter gets permanent bonuses that give you again more moves as you use them as you continue the game. Now after you pass the first and second lap you flip over the block or remove the block to show that it uh, you're on the third lap. Now once you get to the end of the third lap you get the first person crosses the line you play through the end of that round and whoever is furthest along the finish line wins! Charioteer. So, um, I heard a lot of good things about Charioteer. I heard it was a pretty, um, you know, people heard a lot of talking heads buzzing online talking about it. And I gotta be honest, racing games generally are not my favorite, um, but I absolutely loved um, Thunder Rally. I thought Thunder Rally was great, but I, I ended up giving that to Zach after I played um, Apocalypse Road, because I like Apoc Apocalypse Road a little bit more. Just like Thunder Alley, except you get to shoot at each other and stuff, and it was really fun. So I really, really enjoy those racing games. There's one or two others I played I like, but generally they're not my favorite games. Um, so I, I got this game. I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. We sat down. We started playing the game. There are a few things that were not quite as intuitive as we would have liked. A few small things, but, but nothing major. Um, I had to look a few things up on BGG. But as we're playing through the game... It really got quite infectious, and we we're like, okay, I can match these, and, and you're going, and then you're seeing people pull ahead of you, and you're shaking your fists, and you're getting left behind, or you're pulling ahead, and and there, all the fun things you can do, especially when you when somebody deals you damage, and you're just uh, so angry about that, but then you can do it, and I, and I didn't even mention there's even a the, there's even a thing where you can just play three cards and not have them do anything and not move and just clear all your damage, right? So there is that option, and that's one of the great choices of the game is when do I want to try to clear my damage? When I'm way out ahead and they're going to catch up to me, when I'm way behind they're going to get further in front of me. So that that's a great part of the game. And, and not just not just completely clearing the damage or reset there, but when you're playing the yellow, because yellow typically you don't go as far, but you got to get rid of half that damage. But that's such an important part of this game is trying to figure out, okay, when do I just want to break for it? When do I want to fix this damage? Because damage, it, it accrues fast as people play those red symbols. Um, and, and it's fun too with the Emperor, because you never know what he's going to do, going to give you that little extra boost or maybe attack you. Thematically, the, the crowd is throwing stuff at you, right? So there's some other things, interesting in, things in here too, like there's a, there's a whip that lets you kind of pull up to people and, and you can't pass them though. I mean, there's, there's so many fun and interesting things you can do in this game. 
and it is intense. It's is is it's coming down to the wire. You're thinking, oh, what can I do this? Can I pull this out? Can I make this work? So it's really, really a fun and interesting game. We we really enjoyed it. I got to tell you, personally speaking for myself, I loved it. I thought this game was so much more fun than I thought it was going to be. I thought it might be a, a decent game, but I really think this is a decent game. I really had a lot of fun with Charioteer. It blew me away, quite frankly, and I know the rest of the people I played with really enjoyed it as well. Um, I really don't have any negatives other than, like I say, some of the rule book to me was a little counterintuitive, but again, not bad. That's it. I really liked it. I had a lot of fun. It's And it's not too long. It doesn't wear out its welcome. It By the end of the game, you're still having fun with it, right? Which is a really important thing. Some games just go on a little too long. This one doesn't. Love Charioteer. Recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Charioteer is buy it. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on the discriminatinggamer.com. We'd ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd also ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please check out my other channel, that is Cody Carlson PhD, where we talk about military history and books on history. I post some of my lectures on there. Please check it out. Please, please, please subscribe to that channel. I really appreciate it. And please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, leave a thumb to this video on Board Game Geek. That helps us out a lot. You know, I got to tell you, the other day my son was playing with electricity and he shocked himself. So I grounded him until he learned how to conduct himself. Please somebody help me.